like to uh, welcome today Dr. Toto Kukla. He's the founding director of the IPFW Wireless Technology Center at IPFW. He holds an endowed uh, faculty position at ITT, uh, ITT Associate Professor of Wireless Communication and Applied Research, and his research interests include all aspects of modern wireless phone systems. In addition to his academic experience, he has several years of full-time industry experience at uh, Silicon Valley, California. He's worked with the development of several standards for communication systems with IEEE, and he's been instrumental in development of the uh, industry consensus for the establishment of the IEEE 802.11 AA standard devoted to uh, video over wireless. He's received research grants from many organizations, including National Science Foundation, the Air Force uh, Research Laboratory, and many industry uh, sponsors. He's published over 80 papers, and he's the inventor, of, he's the inventor on 18 issued patents. He has his PhD from Tokyo Institute of Technology, and he received many awards for best papers and outstanding research. Here at IPFW this year, he's also the 2011-2012 president of the uh, IPFW chapter of Sigma Xi. And he served in uh, volunteer roles for IEEE, IEEE standards, and he's on the editorial board for the Journal of Undergraduate Research at Purdue University. So it's uh, with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Kukla here today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Don, for the introduction. Um, and thank you very much to everyone for coming on this uh, uh, beautiful day uh, uh, today. So uh, I will talk about uh, modern wireless systems and uh, it'll be mostly on what uh, my research um, is related to uh, certain aspects of modern wireless systems. So in particular, uh, here is the outline of my talk. So um, I will talk about um, the first problem is how do we send actually bits over the air? So in other words, that's the uh, digital modulation problem. And I will talk about the fundamental technology for all high data rate wireless systems today, which is uh, multi-carrier modulation, also known as orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Then I will also talk about some, uh, what I believe very interesting um, uh, um, developments happening recently uh, on the idea of intelligent radios or also known as cognitive radios. So we will, I will address the problem, how do we turn a radio into an intelligent or into a cognitive radio? And I will draw some conclusions uh, uh, from this. Well, in, initially here, let me ask, uh, do you know what are the three biggest inventions of the 20th century? So when people are asked, name the three biggest inventions of the 20th century, there are three, three things that, uh, uh, that come to mind. So the number one is the internet. Well, whatever that, that means. Number two is cell phone, cell phone technology. And number three are laptops. And so we see from, from these from these inventions that, uh, well, they have a very significant wireless component, and actually all three of them. So yes, the internet may not be wireless, but certainly the most interesting aspects, and arguably some of the most exciting aspects of it, is when we are accessing the internet over a wireless connection. Of course, for cell phones, I don't even need to talk about that. That's all wireless. Well, in laptops, one of the, the main reason why people are buying laptops is for connectivity. And so there, the market value of a laptop without wireless connectivity would not be high. Well, as a result, wireless has become uh, the biggest high-tech industry and in probably the biggest industry overall because the numbers are staggering. So wireless is on the order of a trillion dollar business worldwide, right? And there are, there are more than a billion subscribers. There are actually, what, like three billion and it's growing. Um, so the numbers are uh, uh, more than impressive. They're just staggering. So as a result, 
Well, semiconductors, equipment, software, all of these things are mainly for wireless devices. Consumers don't buy semiconductors directly. Consumers buy products, and these products, uh, almost all of them, uh, now provide some sort of wireless connectivity. So, uh, also, the total market, we know that consumers like to uh, replace their wireless devices quite often, so more than a billion phones are sold every year. This is not the total uh, size of the market, and we have more than a million base stations as well being sold per year, which we don't see, but of course, uh, uh, nevertheless, that's a very significant market as well. Another thing that's happening, and it's happening right now, is that uh, now consumers increasingly are using smartphones. As a result of that, mobile data, this is the, the business term for uh, uh, wireless connectivity on a uh, mobile device, so mobile data is increasing 26 times. We are in this time period, so between 2010 and 2015. So, uh, how many other markets are uh, can show a 26 time increase for a period of five years, right? Um, so, uh, the numbers are impressive. We also have a very large defense market in which Yes, in terms of uh, uh, number of devices, the numbers are not as impressive, but in terms of uh, uh, dollar amounts, the numbers are significant. As a result of all this, of course, professors are very interested in wireless because professors are looking for opportunities to do research, and students are interested in wireless because there are many job opportunities. Well, that's, with this introduction, let's now get to uh, some uh, the physics you will, of wireless communications. And so what on this slide is shown is that, well, if I would like to transmit one pulse over a wireless channel, well, what will be received will be a sequence of pulses. So we're sending one, but the receiver sees a sequence of pulses, not just one, but several. Why? Because the transmitted wave will experience many reflections from objects, so maybe on this floor is uh, reflections from ceilings, from ceiling, floor, etc. And so some of these pulses will arrive later, and because after the reflection their power is reduced, so they also arrive at reduced power. This phenomenon is known as multipath, and uh, is characterized by a parameter called delay spread. That is the difference in the arrival times between the first and the last resolvable multipath component. Well, this has important cons consequences when we are designing wireless systems. What this means is that when we are sending packets, or as I call here, complex symbols, such as an OFDM symbol, so when we are sending packets, now we have to introduce some uh, some guard interval between these packets. And this guard interval must be equal to or greater than the delay spread of the wireless channel. Otherwise, there will be interference between uh, packets. And this interference is something that uh, should be avoided at all costs. So, uh, what type of guard intervals are known? Well. Uh, yes, we can just not send anything, so uh, that is a, a sort of guard interval. But a type of guard interval that uh, has been suggested and is found to work well is called a cyclic prefix, or CP, in which, that's at the figure at the bottom, in which we just take a portion of the packet and we repeat it, we precede the packet with that. And that is the guard interval. We will see why this makes sense. So let me show here a block diagram of an uh, OFDM transmitter and a receiver. So the transmitter is simpler. So first we have, after the serial to parallel conversion, we map the bits into symbols. Then we do an orthogonal transform. Uh, that is the inverse fast Fourier transform. 
and then we add the cyclic prefix before we go back to uh, uh, do a parallel to serial conversion. At the receiver, we do the opposite signal processing operations, but we also need to establish synchronization. We need to estimate the channel, so it's, that is why we have some, some additional blocks. Let's now, uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the mathematical equations that describe these devices, that describe a transmitter and a receiver. So first, the equation on top says that the received signal vector, and now I'm using here a vector representation, the received signal vector is a multiplication by H is a channel matrix. So I have a channel matrix. F with the star is the inverse fast Fourier transform matrix. And then X is the transmitted signal vector. W is the noise vector that invariably we also have. So that's, that's what the receiver will see. The objective is to recover X in some fashion. How can the receiver do that? Well, the receiver can do that if it can invert the matrix H. That's the channel matrix. Well, inverting a channel matrix, if, if we are building the firmware in the device, inverting a matrix for every packet is not very pleasant for uh, implementers. It is a complex operation. So it's possible but uh, it's not very desirable. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. Now, the cyclic prefix was added specifically to make the channel matrix circular. So now the matrix has structure. It has very nice algebraic structure that we can exploit. And after applying the forward discrete Fourier transform, that's the F matrix, so then, what do we have? And this is the equation uh, next to last. Now we have, uh, now we are using one very nice algebraic property. That property says that the discrete Fourier transform matrix times a circular matrix times the inverse discrete Fourier transform matrix. Well, it seems uh, complex, but the result is a diagonal matrix. And inverting diagonal matrices is much easier for implementers. So this, this is what saves the industry from having to implement very complex operations. And this is one of the key properties that enable high data rate wireless communications. And so how do we invert the diagonal matrix? Well, we invert diagonal matrix by inverting every component of it. Right? So that is the last equation. So we take the kth component. So now the received uh, y, capital Y of K is just the product H capital of K times the transmitted X of K. Right? So inverting this would be easy. Well, and I'm starting from this equation. So yes, we have this, but it doesn't mean that there are no problems. For example, what would happen if the channel at that particular carrier, the channel coefficient, is equal to zero, right? So then, well, the answer is that what will be received will be just noise, right? That carrier will be wiped out, so we'll get just noise. And uh, the result is uh, a bit error rate floor, right? Such a system will not work very well. And this, is, this was one of the starting points for our research. So we, we have uh, been simulating and, and working on OFDM systems for, uh, for a number of years. And we came up with a, a, different, uh, a different system constructed with a different guard interval. So the, in the proposed system, we, we made a few changes. So on the transmitter side, there are a couple of changes in which we say, well, multiply every uh, prefix sample with phi. And phi is a complex number. 
phi is a complex number that um, actually we determine as a result of uh, uh, optimization technique based on the channel. Also, multiply the entire row of DM symbol with D inverse. Well, D is a matrix, but it's a diagonal matrix, and, and we love diagonal matrices because they are much simpler to work with. And furthermore, the, the elements of the matrix D are related to phi, as we have here. So uh, the number psi is the nth root of unity of phi. We will see why these changes make sense. There is also one change to the receiver in which we the receiver has to multiply the entire symbol with the matrix D. And so here is the new math. Um, and the new math is justified by the theorem that is shown at the bottom. So now in the theorem, we say, well, we have a channel matrix H, but now we have H sub phi. So that is the new channel matrix. And this channel matrix is diagonalized, but in a more general way. So we need not only the uh, uh, discrete Fourier transform, but we need this diagonal matrix D. And so that's why we need D inverse on the transmitter side and we need D on the receiver side and then we diagonalize that. And this is, this is now how the system works. This channel matrix is, well, we, uh, is now skew circular. So it still has uh, a nice algebraic structure. So how does this how does this perform? Let me uh, show you that. So um, we have done very extensive uh, uh, analysis here in several situations. And we see that actually this is a significant improvement. So usually uh, the uh, criteria is, is bit error rate versus signal to noise ratio. So this is what is shown on this figure. And so clearly the lower the bit error rate at the signal, at the given signal to noise ratio, then uh, that would be better. Or alternatively, to achieve a certain target bit error rate, we will see what is the uh, signal to noise ratio at which that happens. And so now we see a system, the, the system with the error floor is a system for which there is a spectral null. So at one of the carriers and, and we, now we see the error floor. Uh, then we see a system at which uh, the guard interval is all zeros, and then we see the proposed system which outperforms all of them. Well, now there's some other, some other simulations. These are now more realistic simulations that now take into account a lot of non-idealities. So, of course, uh, what I described earlier was the... Um, um, theoretical construction, but in practice we have a lot of non-idealities that we have to deal with. And we do not want to build systems that break down when, when non-idealities are thrown at them. So when the channel estimation is not perfect, and in practice it will not be perfect, we are seeing that this system is quite robust. Right? And this is, a, a, furthermore, this simulation is done uh, assuming that the communication channel is what is, what is known as a bad urban channel. So there are several standard channel models, uh, and so this is the bad urban channel model. And we're seeing significant improvement. That's on the order of uh, something like uh, uh, three, four uh, decibel of improvement, and at high signal-to-noise ratios, even greater improvement. Well, we can throw mobility. And so these are uh, pedestrian speeds at uh, two kilometers an hour, four kilometers an hour. And we are also seeing uh, improvement of uh, uh, several decibels improvement. Uh, so the improvement is uh, here quite significant. So uh, this was my, the first part of uh, uh, the lecture today. So I addressed here, described our research regarding digital modulation. But now I'd like to proceed to uh, what uh, may be even a more interesting topic is how do we make uh, radios intelligent? And uh, what I will be talking about is that first uh, we need reconfigurable radios, uh, also known software-defined radios, 
So yes, we, we do need uh, software-defined radio platforms, but we need more than that. And what uh, uh, we think uh, is necessary is, is a concept that is, uh, uh, is known from computer science, that is the concept of ontologies. And we think that this together is, uh, is the practical way to build uh, cognitive radios. So first, I said, we need software-defined radios. So now let's look, look at the uh, radio from a different perspective. Let's look at the electronics. And so what is the block diagram of a radio? Well, on the, uh, on the right side uh, here, you see we have some, some sort of digital hardware. That digital hardware runs the algorithm. So I mentioned earlier there is fast Fourier transform algorithm, et cetera, channel estimation. So that is all run on the digital hardware. Then, of course, on the leftmost side, we have uh, an antenna system. And uh, to, in, in transmission, uh, a, current, a current flows through the antenna, and the antenna emits an electromagnetic wave. So clearly, between the digital hardware and the antenna, we need some analog circuitry. So first, we will need an analog to digital converter, and then we will need amplifiers, filters, and we will need perhaps an up converter to up convert the signal to the desired radio frequency. And the reverse operations will take place uh, in a receiver. So this is a, a block diagram of a software-defined radio. And the bottom connections here are uh, connections that uh, this is that illustrate exactly why the radio is software defined. So these are the control signals that control the antenna. So we'll tune the antenna to a given radio frequency and we'll tune all the up converters and filters and so on. So this is a structure for software defined radios. Well, one potential problem with this structure is that it's not quite modular. It's not modular because if we want to, if we replace the analog circuitry, well, the digital hardware, according to this structure, is tightly coupled to the analog circuitry. So we can't replace them independently. And now, in industry, values modularity. Furthermore, there are now some very interesting uh, architectures. So there are architectures for what are called software-defined radio clouds. They're very similar to cloud computing concepts, in which case the digital hardware is far from the analog circuitry. Maybe the digital hardware is in a room like this, air-conditioned, and to improve coverage, the antenna with all the analog circuitry is on the roof of the building, and they're all connected with, a, with an uh, optical cable. So for these architectures, this, archi uh, this SDR architecture is, doesn't support them very well because of all these complex connections between the analog and the digital hardware. So what can we do? Well, we can make this architecture completely modular. So we can introduce a packet connection. right? And, and packet connections, uh, engineers and, and uh, Many engineers understand them very well, and, and they, they work very well. So now there is a packet connection between the digital hardware and a block. So we're introducing a new block that's called the encoder or parser. And so this packet connection they will carry data packets and will carry also control packets, or here we call them context packets. These context packets will specify what is the frequency of operation, what is the bandwidth of operation, right? what is the output power. So now the radio will, will have the ability to dynamically change these parameters, something that most radios at present do not do. And so this architecture supports very well uh, software-defined radio clouds, supports reconfigurable radios, but it also supports cognitive radios. So now the next step is 
to make the software-defined radio cognitive. What does that mean? There are many definitions that have been suggested for cognitive radios. But I will use a somewhat informal, but nevertheless uh, a fairly accurate definition, that cognitive radios, they must be self-aware. So they must be aware about their own parameters. They must be aware about their uh, RF frequency, about the power, about the bandwidth that they are operating in. And they must be aware about other radios, what radios are around them, or what we call what is the radio environment around them. And so these parameters that radios need uh, to be aware about, these are exactly the parameters in the context packets that I mentioned earlier. So then, well, to, if a radio is aware, or if a radio wants to be aware about the radio operating environment, a radio maybe needs to, uh, can be asked, what is your RF center frequency? What is your bandwidth? What is your power level? Right? These are fundamental parameters in wireless communications. So how can this happen? And so here we come to the conclusion that radios need to speak the same language, so to speak, so to enable these, uh, to be able these questions to be asked and answered. And this is where, um, some, I'm not a computer scientist, but this is where we had to study some concepts from computer science. And we found these concepts to be quite useful. So such a concept is the concept of ontology. So, um, and which originated from the computer science area of the semantic web. So ontology is, for us, is just a way to describe, you can describe almost anything using ontologies. And one simple ontology is, what is what's called resource description framework, or RDF. In which, with, with which ontology, things are described in triplets, as, as, as shown here. So, and in this way, we describe the parameters in the context packets of the software-defined radio architecture. So, here is one RDF description. And so first we have, we give maybe the device ID, so the, to say about which device does this uh, description pertains. And what is the purpose of this description? The purpose is about to communicate the current state of that device. What is the current state? Well, a given RF, and RF is of course radio frequency. So a given RF frequency, and in this case, let's say that is uh, 2,412 megahertz, uh, given bandwidth, and in this example the bandwidth is 20 megahertz, and the pound sign means that this is about the current device ID, and what is the output power of this device, right, 30 dBm in this case, or in this case which is uh, 1 watt. Well, now how can we ask a radio. Well, if two radios share the same ontology, now that is their common language. And so one radio now can, can query another radio. And this is how uh, this can be accomplished using this ontology. So now in the query there are uh, question marks, and so question marks preceding x, y, and z, where x is defined to be RF frequency, y here is defined to be bandwidth, and z is defined to be output power. And so if a radio gets this question, now it knows all it's being asked about these parameters, and therefore it can send uh, the information about its current state. So we can do more. The third step here is to tell a radio to change state, right? And why do we need to do that? Well, we need to do that because, for example, if a radio is transmitting at very high output power, 
maybe it doesn't need to shout if it can get its data through. So we can tell the radio, well, I mean, the power can be reduced. Or we can tell the radio, well, move to a different frequency band that is currently available. Right? So in this way, we enable what is now called dynamic spectrum access, which is where the, uh, which is a major current trend in wireless communications. So in this case, to tell a radio to change state, well, we have the device ID and the purpose here is to change state. And now we're saying, oh, tune to an RF frequency of 5200 megahertz. And now, not only that, but use 40 megahertz of bandwidth. Don't use 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And now your output power, well, don't use 30 dBm. Use 20 dBm output power. So now we can do that. Not only that, but provided that the two radios are synchronized, we can tell the radio to change state at an exactly defined moment. So the radios, the entire network now can operate synchronously. And so we can say, oh, at this time instant, change to a new state. So about these ontology descriptions. Uh, well, these, some more details. How will this happen? Well, these ontology descriptions will be carried in the payload of a packet, which indeed, which this requires some software in the device, which we call an interpreter, to make sense, to process these ontology descriptions and to understand them exactly the way uh, we would like that to operate. So the sequence of these descriptions doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter whether we specify the RF frequency first, the bandwidth after that, or the opposite way. The, frequent, the order does not matter. Now, these descriptions are easily extensible. Can we add more parameters? Well, of course, we can, and I'm going back here to illustrate that. In this way, we can tune an RF filter in our reconfigurable radio, if that RF filter is tunable. So we can specify uh, what is known as a spectrum mask or a certain uh, a filter characteristic. So we can tune an RF filter and if uh, the interpreter doesn't understand that particular description, well, that's fine. So these, these ontologies, that's why they're nice because they're interpreters, they just ignore what they don't understand. Those parts that they don't understand, they just ignore. Well, there is also another important advantage of this is that now policies can be introduced. So cognitive radius and dynamic spectrum access radius and so on, now there is uh, yet another term and these are policy, policy radius. So uh, what are these policies? Well, a typical policy is do not transmit in a given frequency band when you are in this location. That is a policy. Or, and so there, there could be various policies, but typically frequency bands and locations and are the uh, primary uh, parameters that are being used when policies are specified. Or policies can be transmit only at this time of day, only at this location, only in this frequency, and so on. And so clearly, with, uh, these, with this architecture, now the radio can support any policy that uh, radio regulatory bodies would like to uh, introduce. So as a, now some uh, a summary so far. So what we have been working on uh, and discuss here, so we've been working on new signal processing techniques. These signal processing techniques, the advantages that they provide are higher data rate. So now we can pack more bits per second over one hertz of bandwidth. So they promise increased bandwidth efficiency of the digital modulation technique or increased robustness. So the same data rate but just will be sent 
in a more robust way or some combination between these two. We have also been working on modular software defined radio architectures and these architectures that will support uh, that can enable the implementation of policy based radios, cognitive radios, dynamic spectrum access radios and so on. All of these uh, now buzzwords uh, that uh, will be very important technologies in the future. So we have developed also a description technique so that radios can express their own capabilities and radios can interoperate with other cognitive radios. So we consider these description techniques as an important interoperability enabler. Right? And the more we consider this to be a practical approach to implement uh, cognitive radios. So a, moving towards a, uh, a summary, so what is happening right now are very significant changes. So I call them here tectonic shifts in wireless. So some changes that uh, maybe it's helpful to step back and, and think about them. Some 15, 20 years ago, there were no or very few uh, of these ubiquitous now wireless devices. Right? So very few. I guess no one here had a cell phone maybe 15, 20 years ago. Right? There, were, there were very few. Actually, there were cellular networks. There were cellular networks, but uh, uh, with uh, very small capacity. Right? It's like the, uh, for example, I'll just give one example that uh, in a big city such as Houston, the cellular network 30 years ago had a capacity to carry only about 20 phone calls at any one time. And only oil company, companies executives had cell phones back then. Right? So that was not that was clearly not uh, a mass market technology. So today, right, uh, more than 100% of the population carries a cell phone and not only that, but Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. So today we can't live without these devices, right? And as a result of that, wireless has not only technical aspects, but uh, social scientists are studying wireless for other reasons. So it has become a huge market and an opportunity. Another major trend that uh, uh, I think has also motivated our work is the increased software content in wireless devices. So uh, the, what has happened, and I think is, is, uh, is something that's very interesting, is that today the leading wireless companies have become uh, perhaps Apple and Google, at least in the commercial market space, and so these companies, they are not traditionally wireless companies. They are software companies. But they, have, they are riding the trend of the increasing software content in wireless devices. And because they know that uh, wireless is great, uh, that trend has propelled them to, uh, has made them very prominent and very successful. And so there will be, uh, uh, in the future, I firmly believe that as a result of that, uh, there will be uh, even more opportunities in wireless because clearly people are not abandoning their cell phones and their uh, laptops and so on. So wireless is uh, here to stay with us. Um, so this is a summary of my uh, presentation. So I talked about briefly about uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is the foundation of all modern high data rate wireless systems. Uh, this technology uh, became practical over, only over the last maybe 10 years, 10, 15 years. So really the mass market for it uh, uh, happened in the last 10 years. Uh, I also talked about how do we make uh, radios intelligent and we make them intelligent by making them first software defined and then adding some uh, some other software algorithms and in particular I talked about uh, uh, ontologies which uh, uh, I believe is a is a practical way to enable uh, cognitive networking and, and these things have become practical only recently so uh, we believe that they will have an impact in the years to come. So with this I uh, would like to thank you very much for uh, coming today. 
Uh, but, uh, as they say, last but not least, there are some uh, people here that I want to acknowledge. Uh, here, so the uh, uh, people that uh, I'd like to thank first is uh, uh, ITT, and I'd like to thank the people that first established the Wireless Technology Center. That is, uh, uh, well, Mike Newell is not here today, but uh, I'm really happy that Jim Isaacs is here. Uh, I'd like to thank the administration, the uh, university, for supporting the center um, here, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, Dr. Carl Drummond, um, who played a very important role. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Department of Engineering, and in particular, I've worked with uh, uh, Carlos, the department in establishing the center. I'd like to thank for uh, and their continued support for that. Uh, so with this, uh, I can of course uh, um, maybe answer some questions that you might have. Yes. I'm in the amateur radio, and I noticed that bandwidth isn't there because everybody wants a piece of bandwidth now. It looks like that bandwidth is going to be an issue in the future because now everybody has a portable device. Everybody wants more bandwidth. It looks like this is pretty much the only way you're going to keep the trend available so that everyone has uh, access to bandwidth. Otherwise, you're going to be looking like Chicago traffic at rush hour because you know, there's nothing left. Is this going to be a future trend, or is there anything besides this to increase the availability? Because the way cell phones are going now, there's not going to be enough for everybody. Uh, I think I understand the, the question. So. Uh, the question is, uh, will there be enough bandwidth, in short, right? That's, that's, that's what I take. Yes, and that is a, that is a very important question. Uh, certainly today, 99% of the population is, is using wireless at very high data rates. So this is a challenge, right? And everyone wants megabits per second, and, and if possible, hundreds of megabits per second, and so on. So. This is why dynamic spectrum access is viewed as the technology that uh, will help with the uh, um, provide will help with bandwidth efficiency and therefore help providing enough bandwidth. So uh, uh, the currently uh, the well currently the model is that. Uh, there are spectrum allocations, so they're only given frequency bands over which cell phones operate. And uh, uh, this model has been appropriate maybe up to now, uh, but uh, it's not clear that this model is optimal and it's not clear that it will survive in the future. But dynamic spectrum access is the answer to uh, fundamentally to the problem of uh, adequate spectrum, and so that is that's uh, what I'll say in short. Yes. Um, so, uh, kind of related to this question here. Uh, so, we've got this problem of radios being dynamic and um, intelligent, if you will, cognitive radios. And so uh, they're being aware of each other through this ontology of uh, describing themselves. Uh, so now you've got a bunch of radios in an area, and they have to be aware of themselves and communicate and optimize. This kind of implies that there has to be some kind of a common channel, a control channel. That, That's right. That, and so the question is, how do, how do we set up that control channel given the dynamics of the situation? Right. And so that is another uh, very good question. So, and I will even uh, show that uh, show those slides with uh, 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 these illustrative, um, illustrative ontology commands or descriptions. And so the uh, uh, the question is that well, what is going to happen if a radio doesn't know initially over which frequency to operate? So in a completely ad hoc networking uh, scenario, if, uh, uh, if you will, maybe a radio initially doesn't know which frequency to tune to, to listen to these descriptions. And so what should the radio do then? And the answer to that 
is, yes, the industry has spent, and of course a lot of uh, uh, researchers at universities have spent a lot of time studying, well, should there be or shouldn't there be a control channel? The control channel is a channel that a radio can assume that is always available, so that in advance it will know that if it listens to that control channel, at least it will find this information, it'll, the information to tune to a given frequency band will be sent over the control channel. And so the current, uh, uh, I believe what the prevailing viewpoint is that a control channel would be, uh, uh, yes, would be necessary. That enabling this without the existence of a control channel would be really difficult. And this has been studied, uh, uh, it has been studied extensively under uh, one uh, European Union program. Uh, but then for practical considerations, uh, this has not been implemented. I think the in, what the industry found difficult to resolve is which company will control the control channel, right? Which company will own that? And that, that may seem to an outsider, may seem a, a, a problem that should, should be resolved, but the industry found that that problem is very difficult to be resolved. So, uh, well, the, nevertheless, uh, uh, I mentioned this, so nevertheless, uh, maybe a consortium of uh, service providers. So maybe I think what in Europe they're looking at is probably some sort of a consortium agreement. And so all service providers, at least all the major service providers can pull together. And so the control channel will not belong to any one of them in particular, but will belong to that consortium. So uh, that is uh, one way that probably this uh, can, uh, can happen. Yes, yes, Jim. I thought it was interesting when you, when you said that um, the three things that have influenced uh, our way of living, if you will, and I think if you were in, ask several people that question, you might get different answers about that. And uh, I was thinking about that uh, myself a little bit, but uh, if you go back and look at, depend on your perspective where you came from, an engineering or biological or whatever type of background, technical background, but uh, one of the things, that I think the internet obviously would be one that people would kind of come to mind as having tremendous influence on us today. But um, early on, I think one of them would be the digital revolution, as we call it, that going from analog to digital, that some of us older guys would know that, but um, that certainly had a profound effect on everything we use, just about. And I think the wireless one, obviously, has got to be one of the big ones now that is having tremendous economic impact and social impact on us. And there's probably more, but I think it's an interesting question to say, what are those things? Uh, right, uh, and I was using, when I gave those three answers to the question, uh, those answers are what a study, I think a study was done, so after uh, systematically investigating that question, so, Yes, if you ask different people, you might get different answers to uh, this question, but overall, this is what people believe to be the three most important inventions. Thank you very much. <laughs>